Lauren and I have Sam and Kelly with me and we are students from the Monash Law Clinics. In this video, we're going to be giving an overview of property settlements and how property is adjusted and divided. There are five steps in considering how to make a property settlement. These steps are located under Section 79 of the Family Law Act. These steps are determining the asset pool, considering whether it is just and equitable to make any adjustments, what contributions are made by the individuals, what the future needs are, and lastly, whether the settlement reached is just and equitable in the circumstances. These steps apply to court-based property settlements and for agreements that are made outside of court. Time limits apply to separating couples as to when they can make an application in court for property division. Divorcing couples have 12 months from the date the divorce was finalised to put in an application in court for a property settlement, while those in de facto relationships have two years from the date of separation. We will now walk you through each of the five steps. The areas discussed in this video can be found in sections 75 through 90 of the Family Law Act. The first step in property settlements is to determine the asset pool, which is made up of everything owned and everything owed. Common assets include the family home, savings, business interests, investment properties, personal property like jewellery, household items and motor vehicles. Superannuation is also included in the asset pool. Common liabilities include mortgages, credit card debts and loans. This assessment is complicated and you may want to seek legal advice. Next, it will be determined whether it will be just and equitable to make any adjustments to each person's property interest in the first place. In this case, just and equitable means it should be right and just, as well as fair for both parties. For example, it may be just and equitable to make an adjustment where there is a house under one person's name, but two people contributed jointly to the mortgage. The third step is to consider all the contributions made by each individual. Contributions may include any property acquired or owned before, during or after the relationship. This will depend on the individual circumstances. The first type of contribution is financial contributions, which can be indirect or direct. Direct contributions can include wages and salaries, any land or other property owned, payments of the purchase price of or deposits on a house mortgage repayments, the costs of repairs or improvements to a home, and inheritance. Indirect financial contributions are essentially anything else. The second type is non-financial contributions in relation to the property. For example, if an individual painted a house instead of hiring someone, that would be a non-financial contribution. The third type is contributions made to the welfare of the family including any contributions as a homemaker or parent. For example, where one person stay home to look after the children so the other could pursue a career. The fourth step is looking at the future needs of the individuals to decide whether further adjustments are needed. Factors can include age and state of health, income, earning capacity, including physical and mental capacity, who has primary care of any children under 18 or dependents. Before finalizing any proposed adjustment, the last step is to stand back and look at the whole proposal to ensure it is just and equitable in all circumstances. What needs to be looked at in this step will vary from person to person. We hope this provides a good foundational knowledge of what needs to be considered in dividing or altering property interest. Keep an eye out for future videos in the property series from more students of the Monash Law Clinic.